Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. This is a continuation of the previous video, which was uh, on uh, the March 2020 paper 2-2. So we left two questions and now uh, we'll be doing question five and six in this video. So question five, it says myasthenia gravis and HIV slash HIV slash AIDS both involve disorders of the immune system. Outline why myasthenia gravis is described as a disorder of the immune system. Autoimmune disease, uh, self and non-self are not recognized, antibodies produced against self antigens. It, it actually destroys your own body cells. And the reason why is that the lymphocytes which make antibodies against your own antigen should have been destroyed. When they mature in the thymus, they should have been destroyed, but this is not being destroyed. So that is why they result in the disease called autoimmune disease. A person with HIV AIDS has a weakened immune system. This is because HIV infects cells of the immune system in a particular T helper lymphocytes. The pathogen can remain inactive within host cells. In some people, the pathogen becomes active and causes the number of helper T lymphocytes to decrease. So we're talking of the helper T lymphocytes and these will decrease. Now there is a treatment which we give which is called antiretroviral therapy. This is called ART, antiretroviral. Retroviruses are those which contains RNA, R for retro, R for RNA. And so antiretroviral therapy is used to treat people who are infected with HIV or who are living with HIV. And ART aims to keep the number of helper T lymphocytes at a healthy level. So we don't want them to decrease we want them to be maintained at a healthy level because this is mainly going to protect them. It's going to result in the immune response, which is absolutely essential against pathogens. State the full name of the pathogen known as HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. So you have to know the name, you have to spell it correctly. Now it says explain why it is important that ART maintains a healthy number of helper T lymphocytes in a person living with HIV. Increased risk of developing infectious diseases. If his number of helper T lymphocytes decrease, then he is going to be prone to any infection. Uh, he could have a viral pneumonia, he could have uh, tuberculosis, he could have typhoid, cholera, any disease which is an infectious disease. So increased risk of developing an infectious disease, one mark, less cytokines secreted. You see, when the helper T lymphocytes are activated, they produce cytokines. So if this is, if the helper T lymphocytes are low, then these are the two points that we give you. And the role of cytokine then we give you is, uh, stimulates, the cytokines stimulate macrophages. So if there are no cytokines, then uh, less uh, Microphages stimulated, less uh, stimulation of the plasma B cell, this is all less. Less stimulation of the plasma B cell, less antibodies produced, more time for the pathogen to spread and fewer memory cells will be produced. So this is the reason why it would be a good idea to give them ART so that the number of helper T lymphocytes remain, remain well in number and they remain normal instead of decreasing. We come to the D part of the question and figure 5.1 shows global estimates of the percentage of people living with HIV. This is here. We've got it on this side. Who received treatment with ART in each year from 2000 to 2015. So we're talking of 2000 to 2015. Now this is a 15 year period that we're talking about. The number of people who died from HIV, the number of people who died. Now you've got to look at the key here. And the key is the bars are the percentage of people living with HIV who receive treatment. And the line is the, this line, which I'm going to color red. Now this line is the one which has gone up and then it has gone down. So the number of deaths, so this is the number of deaths is on this side. And this is in millions. So the number of deaths started from what? Now let's look at this figure. 1.5 million. And then it went up to say 2 million. And then it came down to somewhere here, 1.25 million. So 1.5 million went up to 2 million number of deaths. We're reading this side of the graph. 
Why we are reading? Because you see, it said here that the number of deaths from HIV was this line. So please spend time on the graph and understand the graph. So it is very important that you read it off very carefully. And here at 2000, we have what? Percentage of people living with AIDS. So this is about nearly, say, this would be five. So this is about 3% then this remains 3% and then we see it increasing slowly. And if you draw a line, you can see the line here. So you can see the percentage of people living with HIV is increasing from 2000 to 2015. And the number of deaths increased, but then it decreased. So this is how we read off graphs and how we understand graphs. You've got to be important that when you, they give you graphs, they expect you to look at the x-axis and the y-axis and read off correctly. So if you look at the percentage of people living with HIV who receive treatments is about 45 to 46%. You read off this side of the graph. You read this side of the graph. Now, whenever it says describe the trends, Whenever it says describe the trends, well, then you've got to be talking about if there are two things in the graph, then you better be talking about the two things. So the two things were what? Receiving treatment. So this is here. Percentage of people living with HIV receiving treatment increases. This is what I told you earlier. Low rate of increase 2000 to 2004. 3% in 2000. And 45% in 2015. So you've given me data of the graph. Then if you look at the deaths, now the graph of the deaths is slightly different. It says increase in HIV deaths to 2004, then decrease. And the start was 1.5 million, then peak at 2 million, and then it at 1.2 million, and ends at 1.2 million. So when you're describing the trends, and there are two graphs, then you give me the trends of both the graph. But if it's only one graph, then of course you give me if it increased and decreased, then you give me figures of the graph, how much was it initially, then where did it peak, and where did it end. So this is how we do a trends of the graph story. Coming to the part two of the graph, it is part two of the question is recommended that ART is given to all people living with HIV. Some countries that support the recommendations find it difficult to provide ART to everyone living with HIV. Other than the high cost of treatment suggests two reasons why it is difficult to provide ART to everyone living with HIV. Now, the very basic question is why would they not be able to do it? It must be not easy to access. Maybe some people have not even been diagnosed and they have the disease. So lack of trained personnel to give treatment, number one, some unwilling to take treatment. Some might say oh, we don't want any treatment. Then inability to supply enough drugs. Then not all people have been diagnosed. They may not be suffering from any signs and symptoms, so they have not been diagnosed. And difficulty of getting treatment, maybe they live in certain parts of the uh, country is uh, inaccessible to, to cars or vehicles, so the people can't reach those people. So difficulty getting treatment to people. Question six, figure 6.1 is a transmission electron micrograph of a plant parent chyma cell. And you look at the cytosol is the um, liquid part inside it, which is called cytoplasm. It's got the liquid part and it's got the organelle. So fluid part of the cytoplasm, they tell you this in the question. Then the cell sap in the vacuole and the tonoplast. Tonoplast is the vacuole membrane. I'm sure you all know it. This is A-levels. Uh, we even study it at O-levels. So the part A of the question now is asking you some questions. Let's read it. The... External environment of the parenchyma cell has a higher water potential than the internal environment of the cell. The external environment of the parenchyma cell has a higher water potential than the internal environment of the cell. One function of the parenchyma cell is to provide support to the plant. With reference to figure 6.1, suggest how parenchyma cells provide support. So if it's got a higher water potential, we know water moves in, into the cell by osmosis. Vacuole full of water, naturally if the vacuole is full of water, well, it's going to exert outward pressure. And this, of course, gives it hydrostatic support. Like if you have something, 
something as water in it, like in a balloon you have air, so the air is providing it, so that won't be hydrostatic. But if you put water in the in a balloon or something with a plastic container which can uh, distend when you add water to it, that will be providing hydrostatic pressure. So vacuole exerts outward pressure, hydrostatic pressure. Then uh, coming to the B part of the question, the image shown in figure 6.1 is at a higher magnification that can be obtained using a typical light microscope. Explain what is meant by the term magnification. That's a very direct question. There's no ambiguity about it. Either we know it or we don't know it. Number of times an image is larger than the real size or the actual size. So magnification definition, you must know the definition of resolutions, all the defines in the syllabus, you must underline and learn them. The actual diameter of the parent gamma cell is 35 micrometer. Now calculate the magnification. So you measure that, the measure is seven centimeter. So 70 millimeter is equal to 70,000 micrometer, but it's originally 35. So this is the 35 which we are talking about here. And this is the 35 that I've written here. And so it gives you a magnification of uh, 2000. This is what the magnification was. Part C of the question is that the cell sap in the vacuole of the cell shown in figure 6.1 has a pH of 5.0. The cytosol has a pH of 7.2. So cytoplasm is the liquid part of the cytoplasm and the cell sap has a pH of 5 and the cytosol has a pH of... So inside, what we have in the vacuole is uh, 5, pH 5, and outside we have 7.2. Now it says the tonoplast controls the passage of hydrogen ions from the cytosol into the vacuole. So this is the cyto this is the cytosol. Let me give it another color. This is the cytosol and the passage of ions from the cytosol into the vacuole. So into the vacuole is this part. Now outside this we have something which has been called the tonoplast, which I'm coloring in yellow. So the tonoplast controls the passage of hydrogen ions from the cytoplasm here into the tonoplast, into the vacuole. So the low pH created by the entry of hydrogen ions is optimum for the action of acid hydrolase enzymes in the vacuole. Acid hydrolase enzymes are also found in lysosomes in animal cells. Suggest which transport mechanism is used to move hydrogen ions from the cytosol of the parenchyma cell into the vacuole. Naturally, if it is going to be from a low concentration to a high concentration, it has to be active transport. And then vacuole has a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions needed to move against the concentration gradient. This requires ATP. And of course, for every active transport, you know if there's active transport, there's a channel protein which is needed. So a channel protein or a membrane protein would be needed in the tonoplast, which will allow it to enter which will be then transported by active transport. Now let's look at part two, suggest how the structure of the tonoplast allows hydrogen ions to be transported into the vacuole, but does not allow the ions to leave the vacuole. Charged particles cannot cross the hydrophobic core, movement through specific membrane protein, only allows one way movement, and binding site would be on the cytosol side because that's where it will bind, change shape, and then allow it to move inside. So charged particles cannot cross the hydrophobic core. Movement through specific membrane proteins only allows one-way movement. That's what they're telling you in the question. Allows hydrogen ions to be transported into the vacuole, but does not allow the ions to leave the vacuole. So basically, you're in fact writing the words of the question in another form. And the binding site is on the cytosol side come to the last part of the question, which is the part three, the acid hydrolases in the vacuole. So the acid hydrolases are in the vacuole, cannot function in neutral conditions, pH seven or alkaline conditions. So you've got the cell here, you've got the vacuole inside, and we've got the hydrolases somewhere here inside the vacuole. Explain the advantage the plant cell of having acid hydrolases that cannot function in neutral, near neutral, or alkaline conditions. So 
Acid hydrolases break down, digest, hydrolyze large molecules. Now, we don't want them to enter the... We, if, if they leak into the cytosol, then they will digest all the molecules there, any protein molecules, any other starch molecule. So it will hydrolyze it. So this avoids damage to cell contents or organelles in the cytosol because even if they leak from the vacuole into the cytosol, they will not be able to work in the cytosol. So that is in a way an advantage. And if you read the question again, the acid hydrolysis in the vacuole cannot function in neutral conditions. Explain the advantage the plants have having a hydrolysis that cannot function in neutral, near neutral or alkaline conditions. So these acid hydrolases can only work in the vacuole where the pH is being maintained at a lower level of 5. But the rest of the cytoplasm has a pH of 7. So the acid hydrolases will break down, digest or hydrolyze, but they will not, even if they leak into the cytosol, this will be avoiding damage to the cell contents or the organelles in the cytosol. So the leakage from the vacuole into the cytosol would not be a very harmful phenomena. Thank you. And this finishes this uh, paper. This is the paper two, which is going to be examined very soon. So I hope this is going to be helpful and you can understand some of the key points in uh, doing a paper two, which is of course a very important AS level exam. And I wish you all the best.